greet everyone and say good morning. Um, it's good to see all of you uh, here this, this fine uh, Thursday morning. And uh, we're going to take up the subject of Revelation 9. Revelation 9 is the subject of the Muslim world and Bible prophecy, Islam and Bible prophecy. Um, I will tell you right now that I'm not going to cover every single thing because uh, there is resource and material that you can um, make yourselves uh, available to. Um, so we're going to touch on Islam today, just go through some of the symbols, just identifying them from the Bible. And then tomorrow we're going to look more into uh, sacred history and see how this has to uh, tie in with what happened on September 11, 2001. And what does that mean to us as Seventh-day Adventists as we talk about um, revival and reformation and um, also the understanding of um, Daniel 11, chapter 40 to 45. So at this time, let us um, seek the Lord in prayer by kneeling together. <clears throat> Our Father which art in heaven, we bow before your glorious and righteous throne, seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, that all things that are necessary for us to have in this life and in the life to come would be added unto us. We ask and pray for prophetic wisdom and insight uh, from your holy scriptures, the scriptures of the prophets, the revealed mysteries of the gospel of the kingdom. We pray that you would make us wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, and that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophetic power, inspiring our minds and hearts to understand and comprehend the truths for this time. And I pray that they would be as a mighty cleaver of truth to separate us from the world, from the Protestant churches that have rejected these messages, and as well as to separate us from all sin, iniquity, and transgression. Uh, please allow your heavenly blessing to be upon us. Refresh us, we pray, with your presence, with your power. In Jesus' name we ask and pray, amen. I invite you to take your Bibles. We're gonna turn to Revelation chapter nine at this time. Revelation chapter 9, and this is one of the foundations of Adventism. The Millerite Adventists had a very good understanding of Islam. Um, and when we talk about the subject of Islam, the reason why it's important is because you're going to find that Islam is one of the, the subjects in Bible prophecy that helps to empower God's people, to empower the message of the hour, which comes from the book of Daniel for their time period and for our generation as well. But at the end of the world, Seventh-day Adventists really do not have a, a clear understanding of who Islam is in Bible prophecy and what their role is, especially as we talk about in time events, okay? Uh, most of us or most people have a a blurred understanding or, or confused concepts and ideas about Islam and sometimes it's based upon conspiracy theories and secret societies and what the Jesuits say and what Catholicism says about it but we don't have an understanding of what Jesus Christ says about Islam and Jesus Christ is revealing to us through the revelation um, this special people in Bible prophecy and I would venture to say that just as important as Israel is in Bible prophecy, Islam also is important in Bible prophecy as well. And so in this particular study, we're going to begin to go through chapter nine and just look at some symbols here in this hour. And then tomorrow we're gonna be getting into the trumpets and getting into the woes and also the time prophecies uh, concerning the fifth and sixth trumpet, which is in Revelation nine. So in, in verse one, the Bible says, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now, we want to identify what this star is, okay, because in Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, the stars represent angels, and angels are messengers or 
ministers. And most times when we're talking about a messenger, a messenger can be a religious or political leader, religious or political minister. For example, in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, chapter 24, we look here at the prophet Balaam. Balaam tried to curse the people of God, but in trying to curse the people of God, he ended up blessing God's people. He attempted to curse them three times and ended up blessing them three times. And then before Balak was disappointed and Balaam went his way, he tried to curse them for a fourth time and ended up blessing them for a fourth time. Very interesting that there's three blessings followed by a fourth blessing because, again, this represents the three angels followed by the fourth angel. This is one of those places in the Bible where we see the three-in-one combination. Now, in Numbers 24, verse number 15, the Bible says here, And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. So the Bible here says that there's going to be a star that comes out of Jacob and a scepter will arise from Israel. And a scepter is the staff of a king. So we're talking about a, a star who would be king in Israel. And you'll notice that the star has a capital S, not a lowercase s. So this is Balaam's prophecy. Who was it that fulfilled this prophecy? this star that would arise out of Jacob. Interesting enough that even when you study Genesis 49, and Jacob here begins to tell his sons what will befall them in the last days, and these are latter-day prophecies concerning the 12 tribes or the 144,000, the descendants from the 12 sons of Jacob. Even Jacob prophesied that in Judah there was also going to be a, a, a star or, or, a, or a scepter and a star, one named Shiloh, would come out of Judah, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, in Matthew chapter 2, we see here the fulfillment of Balaam's prophecy, who the star was, this religious leader who was to come out of Israel. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. These wise men that came from the east were studying the prophecies of Balaam. And that is what led them to Christ. They followed the star that was in the east and they said, Hey, where is he that is born king? of the Jews. This was based upon Numbers 24 verses 16 and also verse 17. So a star can be a leader, a political or religious minister. I'm not going to identify right now who this star is historically in Revelation 9, but I do want you to know that it is a religious or political leader. And we see this also being referred to in Revelation chapter 8. Turn to Revelation 8 with me. Revelation 8. Revelation chapter 8, and I want us to look at verse number 10. Let's look at the third trumpet. Tomorrow we're going to go through these trumpets very briefly and show you the historical fulfillment of this prophecy. Revelation chapter 8, verse 10. The Bible says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountain of water. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now tomorrow we will identify 
who this is. This, this star is Attila the Hun, okay? And we'll, we will see historically why that is, but Attila the Hun was the great star in this particular trumpet, okay? So in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth trumpet, we're seeing a leader as well, religious or political leader or minister, okay? Now, back in chapter 9, which is just over the page, chapter 9, the Bible says, and to him, this religious, political figure, to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This is the first time we see the word bottomless pit appear in the book of Revelation. Let us identify what the bottomless pit is. Now, this word pit in the Greek, in Revelation chapter 9, comes from the word, or is the word abusos. Okay, and abusos is where we get the word, the English word abyss. Okay, so when we're talking about the bottomless pit, we're talking about the abyss. And in the Bible, the Bible actually tells us what is the condition of an abyss, okay, or a pit. We see this being mentioned in the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Let's turn to Genesis. Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis chapter 1, and beginning with Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It's very important for us to, uh, to know what the bottomless pit is so that we can have the setting, the geographical location of this uh, prophecy of the fifth trumpet. It says here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. This word deep here is the same... Uh, word for abusos, but in the Hebrew. It's an abyss, this word deep. And associated with the word deep, it says that the, that the earth is form, void, and darkness. Okay, so void, uh, darkness, the deep, the abyss. Okay, now let's compare other scriptures to give us further understanding and a description of this bottomless pit. In the book of Jeremiah, Flip with me to Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23. And you want to look for some similarities of what we just read about in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In Jeremiah 4, 23, it says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. Okay, this is exactly what we just read in Genesis chapter 1, verses 2. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. So we're looking at this earth, okay? Void, dark, desolate, says no man, okay? No birds, no light. And of course we know that this is how the earth is going to be for a thousand years when Jesus Christ comes back again and Satan is bound on this earth for a thousand years and the earth is desolate, we know that this is exactly how the earth is going to be. It's going to actually revert back to the way it was before man was created. We understand this, but the point that we want to examine is in verse 26. Verse 26 says, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. Okay, I want you to zero in on the word wilderness there, because wilderness is associated with uh, this uh, condition in verse 23 as the earth is without form, void, and the heavens had no light, and there was no man. The wilderness is associated here with this abyss, okay? Now, let's look at one other text, in Jeremiah chapter 2. Turn over to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, and let's look at verse 6. And you're going to see how the wilderness, the pit, the abyss, all one and the same. Jeremiah 2, verse 6 says, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt and led us through the wilderness, 
through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passed through and where no man dwelt. Okay, that's Jeremiah chapter 2, verse number 6. So here we see the wilderness, we see the desert, we see the pits, and we see that it is a place where no man passed through or where no man dwelt. Okay, so here in Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, this bottomless pit is nothing more than a desert wilderness region. A desert wilderness region in the earth is this bottomless pit. So this key is given to this fallen star and he opens this bottomless pit where we have the desert wilderness like area in the earth. Now something comes out of this bottomless pit or out of this desert or out of this wilderness. Turn back to Revelation 9 and let us see what is going to come out of this wilderness, out of this desert, out of this pit. Now I want to let you know that when you study the bottomless pit, the bottomless pit, there's nothing good about the bottomless pit, okay? The bottomless pit is mentioned four times, okay? This is the first time you see the bottomless pit. In Revelation 11, which we studied a little bit, not in its entirety, atheism comes out of the bottomless pit, okay? Revelation 17, the papacy, as it is revived and resurrected with its deadly wound healed, comes out of the bottomless pit. And then in Revelation 20, Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years, then he comes out. So, so the bottomless pit has something to do with, with, with wickedness, has something to do with deception, has something to do with darkness, and also with persecution. So the bottomless pit is not something that is good. It is negative in the book of Revelation. But he opens this bottomless pit, and the bottomless pit here is a wilderness, desert, uh, region or country. And you have to remember that the bottomless pit is different in Revelation. It is not always the same. You have to interpret it according to the time period and according to the other scriptures that are before and uh, after it. So here in verse 2, he opened the bottomless pit and there rose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So what comes out of the bottomless pit? It says the smoke of a great furnace. Okay now let's focus on furnace for a moment because when we think of furnace what comes to our mind when we think of furnace? Okay we think of heat Okay. Hail. Fire, hail. What else? What does the furnace symbolize in the Bible? I want you to think persecution. persecution, very good. That's one. What else? Let's let's turn to uh, Deuteronomy chapter four. Let's turn to Deuteronomy four. Persecution is good. We're going to look at that in a moment. Deuteronomy chapter 4. What is this furnace? Because the smoke is like a great furnace. Okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 20. Deuteronomy 4, 20 says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as ye are this day. So God brought his people out of Egypt. Egypt is called the iron furnace. And we know that Exodus 20 verse 2 says that Egypt is the house of bondage. Okay, so the furnace is associated with bondage, with slavery. What about persecution, which was mentioned earlier? Turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, verse 10. The furnace here, bondage, slavery. Isaiah 48, verse 10. Notice what the scripture says here. Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Remember the three Hebrew boys, because they would not bow down to the Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, remember they were thrown into the 
fiery furnace. They were being persecuted. Furnace of affliction. In the book of Revelation, Jesus has feet that are likened unto fine brass as if they had burned within a furnace. Why? Because remember the prophecy in Genesis 3.15 where the Bible says that I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, but, but, it shall, but Christ would bruise the head of Satan, but then Satan would bruise the heel of Jesus. And he, we know that uh, that was fulfilled at Calvary, where, his, where he was nailed to the cross. Christ went through affliction and suffering and persecution for you and I. So when we talk about this smoke like a great furnace, bondage, slavery, also affliction, persecution. But what does this smoke do? Revelation 9 says, you'll go back there. Revelation 9 says that this smoke does something to the sun and air. What does this smoky furnace do to the sun and air? It darkens it. It darkens it. So what does darkness represent in the Bible? Darkness. What's that now? Ignorance. Ignorance, okay, yes. That's, that's very good, yes. What else? Darkness. False Evil. False gospel, okay. Let's, let's notice Acts 26. Book of Acts 26. Acts 26, verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. The smoky furnace, or the smoke like unto a great furnace, darkens the sun and the air. Darkness. Verse 18 of Acts 26, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Satan, we know that there is no light in him. He is darkness. Okay, so this smoky furnace, which represents bondage, slavery, affliction, this smoke would darken the sun and the air. So Satan, through the influence of Satan, the sun and air would be covered up or obscured, okay? What does the sun and the air represent, which is darkened by this smoke? I want you to turn to Malachi, the fourth chapter. Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verse number 2. And the way that we're studying this, it's the same way that we would study Revelation 13. You know, when we study Revelation 13, we talk about the beasts, we talk about the horns, we talk about the heads, we talk about the names, we, we, we'll go through the lion, the bear, the, um, the, the leopard, the, the bear, the lion, the dragon. We go through all the different symbols, okay? And that's, that's the same thing we have to do when we're studying Revelation chapter 9. We have to study it the same way that we would do it when we're trying to identify the two beasts in Revelation 13 and the mark of the beast. So Malachi 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. What does the Son represent here? Well, the Bible says Son of Righteousness. Well, who's righteousness? Christ's righteousness. But, but where is the righteousness of Christ revealed? Where is the righteousness of Christ revealed? Well, that's good, yes, through the saints. Through, yes, our hearts, the saints, yes. But before, but before it gets in our hearts, before it's revealed through the saints, where, where, where must we go in order to... The, okay, the cross, okay, the Bible, okay, the church, yes, cross, church, Bible, yes. The Sabbath, yes, the, the Sabbath is righteousness, right? But who, who has ever seen Jesus Christ walking on this earth as a man, doing his miracles, okay, doing his healings, okay? Were you there 2,000 years ago? How did, you, how did you come to believe? 
Okay, by the word. What word? The, the testimony. Just the, 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 the Bible. Now, someone, someone said it over here. The, the gospel. The gospel. Notice in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You all did very good, by the way. That was good participation. Did everybody's mind thinking? See that everybody is, 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 is interested and into the study. And that we're paying attention. So, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, that is as it is written, the just by faith. So therein or inside of the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So therefore, the Son represents the righteousness of Christ, but the righteousness of Christ is revealed in the gospel. So the Son represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. That would be obscure or darkened through the influence of Satan. Okay, now, what, yes, correct, S-U-N, right, the Son of Righteousness. The Bible likens God to the Son in the Bible, capital S-U-N, but Psalm 84:11 likens God to the Son. That's why Satan wants to use the Son in order to receive worship, because he wants to counterfeit everything that God does. So there's nothing wrong with, with Son, okay? It's when you worship the S-U-N, okay, you worship the, the creation instead of the creator, that's idolatry, okay? So let's not get carried away here, okay? The sun in Revelation 9, which is darkened by the influence of Satan, represents the gospel of Jesus Christ. What about the air, okay? We're talking about symbolically, okay? We're not talking about the literal sun here, all right? What is the air? If the sun is the gospel of Jesus Christ, what's the air? Turn to John chapter 3. The book of John, chapter 3. John chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8. John chapter 3. And let's look at verse 8. Jesus says, Wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it cometh. And whether it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. The wind blows. The air is in the wind, or the wind is in the air. The wind in the air is symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Let's look at one more text. Let's go to John chapter 20. Same chapter, I mean, excuse me, same book. We're going to chapter 20 of John. And we're going to look at verse 21. John chapter 20, verse 21. The Bible says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then you can also look at Ezekiel 37. And he's, you don't have to turn there, but Ezekiel 37 the, uh, the son of man, Ezekiel, is told to prophesy on the bones that they might come back to life again. And he, say, and he says, son of man, prophesy to the wind. And he says, come from the four winds, O breath, that you might breathe upon these slain, that they might live. So we're, the breath of God, the wind, the air, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. Okay, so here we can see that Satan has blinded minds or darkened understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost. And when you don't know Jesus Christ and his righteousness, and if you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, then you will be in bondage. You will be in captivity. You will be afflicted and will go and afflict and attack others without the Holy Spirit, without Jesus Christ and his gospel. Now let's go back to Revelation 9. Let's go back to Revelation 9. So the bottomless pit, it's a desert, wilderness region. The smoke comes out from this wilderness. 
The smoke is like a furnace that darkens the understanding of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit through the influence of Satan. Uh, Revelation 9.3 says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. So not only does this smoke come out of the bottomless pit, which darkens the true understanding of the gospel of, of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Ghost, but now these locusts come up out of this same bottomless pit. These locusts come from the wilderness, and therefore they are darkened. They, they, they are in ignorance concerning the gospel and the Holy Spirit. Now, what are these locusts? What do they symbolize? Let's turn our Bibles to Nahum. Nahum. N-A-H-U-M. Nahum. In the Old Testament. Chapter 3. We're going to look here at verse 17. What are the locusts in Bible prophecy? Nahum. Chapter 3. We're going to look here at verse 17. The prophet says, Thy crowned are as the locusts, and thy captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day, but when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. So the Bible likens, or the Bible compares the locusts and the grasshoppers together because a locust is a grasshopper. A grasshopper is a locusts. Okay, so these locusts or these grasshoppers spring up out of this same bottomless pit. Now, what are these grasshoppers? The Bible tells us in the book of Judges, chapter 7. The book of Judges, chapter 7. Judges, the seventh chapter. Verse 12. Judges, the seventh chapter. Verse 12. Locusts are grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are locusts. What are these grasshoppers? What are these locusts? Judges chapter 7, verse 12 says, And the Midianites, and the Amalekites, and all the children of the west, the children of the east, lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for a multitude. So, we're talking about the locusts, the grasshoppers representing the children of the east, which come from a desert wilderness region that's in the east. They would be influenced or they would be blinded or misdirected by Satan as it relates to who Jesus Christ is, as to who the Holy Spirit is is. And the Bible tells us very clearly that these locusts, which are the children of the east, the Amalekites, the Midianites, that ride on camels. So you have camels that are associated from the wilderness and from the desert and from the east. Because they would not have a true understanding of, of Christ and the Holy Spirit, this would bring bondage. This would bring slavery. This would also bring affliction. But the Bible says that these locusts or these children of the east from the desert wilderness area, it says that they would have power. When the Bible says that man is given power in the book of Revelation, oftentimes it's associated with persecution. Okay, because if a man has power, but he does not have Jesus Christ in his life, and he is not controlled by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He will abuse that power. Okay, he, he will be corrupted by that power. Okay, he will use it to his own advantage. Okay, and even taking advantage of others. In the book of Revelation, let me share this with you. Go to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Revelation 6. I want you to notice with me 
this term and power was given. And I just want you to see how it's used in Revelation. Okay? Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. And let's look at verse number 2. Uh, 3. Pardon me. Revelation 6, 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So the second seal, and I'm not identifying what this seal is at all, but I just want you to see that this rider on the red horse, to him was given power. He had a great sword, and what did he do? He took peace away from the earth, and he killed. Okay, so when power is given to man, we see that he killed. This is talking about persecution. Let's look at verse number 8. Let's look at the fourth seal in verse 8. It says, and I, be, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So, the man whose name is death, hell follows him. When power is given, he kills with the sword, with the beast of the earth, and with hunger, and with death. Turn to chapter 13 of Revelation. Chapter 13 of Revelation. Verse 7. As a matter of fact, verse 5, we know that this is talking about the papacy. It says here in Revelation 13, 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. It's emphasized twice. It's repeated twice that power is given unto the papacy, and we know they persecuted for 1260 years. One more time as we look at this, let's look at chapter 17 of Revelation. Revelation 17. Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 12. We're just seeing how people uses the term and defines it. Power was given. When power is given, it's normally used to kill and persecute. Word of God says, Verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Again, power is given to the, the kings, the ten kings, to reign with the beast, and they make war against the Lamb and his people. So then, in Revelation chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, these, these locusts, these children of the east that come from the desert wilderness area, you're going to see that they had power, and they would use this power to be able to hurt and to kill and to persecute. But I want you to notice now how they're, what kind of power they were given, because in verse 3 it says, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth unto them, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So they have scorpion power. The children of the east, from the desert, from the wilderness, have scorpion power. What is scorpion power? Well, we know that, well, we shouldn't know. I don't think we would want to know. I don't think anybody would ever want to be stung by a scorpion, because it could be very deadly. Now, I think that there are some that probably have been and, and have survived it, but very few chances. If a scorpion stings you and touches you, it could be very fatal. I want you to turn to me, turn with me to Luke, the 10th chapter. Luke chapter 10. And let's allow the Bible to explain to us what is scorpion power. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. Luke 10 verse 17 says, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions 
and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus says, I give you power. I give you power over serpents and scorpions to tread on the power of the enemy. Serpent power is the power of the enemy. Through the power of the enemy, the Bible says that they would have this power. They would persecute with this power. However, verse 4 tells us, go to verse 4, because see, verse 4 is very, very important to understand. Go to verse 4. They would be under the influence of Satan. They would have his power to persecute, but notice what the Bible says in verse 4. They would not understand the true uh, Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Gospel, the, the Holy Spirit, through the influence of the smoke that blinds their understanding. But in verse 4, listen to what it says. In verse 4, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. So even though they would be under Satan's influence and under his power, they would not fully be under his control. You know why? Because it says that it was commanded them not to hurt the grass, not to hurt any green thing, but it says you can only hurt the men with your scorpion power, those men that don't have the seal of God. In other words, the people that have the seal of God are God's true people. The children of the east from the desert wilderness region that are associated with camels would not be able to touch God's people. If Satan was fully in control of these locusts, he would want the seal of God people to die. Satan wants to wipe out the commandment keepers of God. So it lets, it lets me know that there's a higher power than Satan that's directing these locusts. I want to repeat that again. There is a higher power that is directing the children of the east. It was commanded them. Well, who commanded them? Christ was the one that commanded them to be able to not hurt the men that don't have the seal of God. You can hurt everybody else that does not worship me because those that have the seal of God worship the Creator. Those that don't have the seal of God are idolaters, worshipers of false gods. But what is the grass? What do the green things represent in the Bible? Turn to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Who's really directing these locusts? The Bible tells me in the book of Isaiah 40, don't hurt the grass, don't hurt the green things. Only those men that don't have the seal of God. Those that have the seal of God, you can't touch them. The Bible says in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 6 says, the voice said, cry, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Verse 7, the grass withereth, the flower faded, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Surely the people is what? Grass. People represent grass, green things. What about trees? The Bible says in... Daniel. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4. Daniel 4. What are trees? Isaiah 61 3 talks about God's people being called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about a tall tree that all the beasts and all the, the birds and fowls can, can find lodgment under. That tree is cut down. We've studied in part about Daniel 4. Now let's look at verse 19 of Daniel 4 as we want to understand what trees are. Who was this tree that was cut down? The Bible says in Daniel 4.19, Daniel chapter 4.19, then Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar was astonished for one hour and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar answered and said, 
my Lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The tree that thou sawest, which grew and was strong, whose height reached unto the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, the fruit thereof much, and in it was for all under which the beasts of the field dwelt and upon whose branches the fowls of the heavens and their uh, habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong. For thy greatness has grown and reacheth unto heaven and thy dominion to the end of the earth. Notice. Just like in Daniel 2, 38, when Daniel came in and said, King, you are this head of gold. He was the king of Babylon. Now Daniel saying, King, you are this tree. Trees represent the people of God, or trees represent people. Green things, grass, trees represent people, all right? So, children of the east, from the desert, from the wilderness, that have scorpion power to persecute, you can touch everyone but those that don't have the seal of God. It was commanded. Now, I want you to notice Turn to the book of Exodus. Who's in control of these locusts? That's right. God is in control of these locusts. I want you to go to, the, go to Exodus 10 with me. I, I want you to see this from the Bible. Satan may, may be able to deceive. Satan might be able to bewitch. He, he can manipulate. But God is the one that controls the course of human events. God is able to take a power that comes from the bottomless pit and he's able to use them for his service. Even people that, that don't worship and serve him can still be classified as God's servants. You say, well, well wait a minute. What do you mean by that? Remember Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible? You, 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 read, Nebuch you read about Nebuchadnezzar in Jeremiah 27. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was an idol worshiper. He, he, he was a heathen. He was not serving Jehovah God, but yet the Bible says, Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. You say, well, wait a minute. How could God call him his servant? In other words, he was an instrument used by God to bring judgment and desolation to Jerusalem for 70 years. Why? Because they wouldn't keep the law or hearken to the prophets. So not that Nebuchadnezzar was directly serving and worshiping God, but God is able to use men to accomplish his designs. And in that sense, they're serving God. They're, they're carrying out a service for God. Or like Cyrus. God had named Cyrus a hundred years before he was even born. And he said, Cyrus, you're my servant. You're my shepherd. You're the anointed one. You're the one that's going to let my captives go. You're the one that's going to build my, my city. You're going to lay the foundation. Cyrus wasn't even born yet. Did it come to pass? Was it fulfilled? Did Cyrus fulfill that? Yes, he did. Cyrus was his servant, even though he wasn't directly serving and worshiping God. When God can use men, God can use um, organizations to carry out service for him. He's doing the same thing with these locusts here. Notice in Exodus 10, Exodus chapter 10, and let's look here in verse 12. Exodus chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, even all that the hail hath left. And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought a south wind upon all the land. East wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. So notice the locusts are associated with the east because they're the children of the east. But they're also associated with the wind. The wind brings the locusts. The wind is symbolizing also the children of the east. But Verse 14, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coast of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them there was no such locust as they, neither after them shall be such. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was what? Darkened. 
And they did eat every herb of the land, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail have left. And there remained not any green things in the trees or in the herbs of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind, which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coast of Egypt. Who's in control? Of these gods in control. Did, did Pharaoh call for the locusts? Did the Egyptians call for the locusts to come and eat up everything and to bring darkness and destroy their country? No. Interesting that the Bible says that Egypt is the iron furnace, the iron kingdom. In the book of Daniel, who's the iron kingdom? Rome is the iron kingdom. Pharaoh claimed to be the son of God, or Ra, God as man, on the earth, an antichrist, as it were. These locusts are controlled, directed by God. Satan blinds. Satan deceives. They persecute, but God is the one that brought the locusts, and he's the one that took them away. I keep on emphasizing that, okay, because when we talk about the children of the East, in our minds today, again, we, we really don't understand who's really guiding them, who, who's really directing their movements. Are they deceived? Yes. Have they been uh, misguided as who Christ is and who the Holy Ghost is? Yes. But do they have a role to play in Bible prophecy? Yes. Who's commanding them not to hurt those that have the seal of God? Not the devil. God. Because Satan is after those that have the seal of God. The dragon is not wroth with everybody. The dragon is wroth with the woman. And he goes to make war at the render of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and, the, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to go back to Revelation 9. And I want you to recognize that the children of the East, whom we're getting ready to identify in just a few moments, use satanic power to persecute, to afflict to bring into bondage, but they're commanded to do so. They have that charge. This is their role. And we're going to see who it is that they're directing their attacks against. It's not the people of God. It's not those that worship God and keep his commandments. So I want you to notice what it says going on in verse 5. It says, in Revelation 9, 5, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and the torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and, the, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. So notice, they can't even fully kill. All they're doing is tormenting and hurting people. The devil doesn't want to torment and hurt people. The Bible says that the thief cometh not but to kill, to steal, and destroy. I've come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. So. The de so, so again, they're limited in what they could do. If the devil had full control over them, he wouldn't just be tormenting men. He would just have people die because that's what he desires, people to die in Christ's graves. I'm not going to deal with the five months today. We will deal with the five months tomorrow. Verse 7, and the shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. So notice, children of the east from the wilderness, from the desert, that ride on camels, and they have horses unto the battle. These are warriors, fierce, strong warriors from the east. And the Bible tells us that on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of ch chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Notice. Let's look at some of the symbolism here. First of all, it says that they have crowns on their heads. It says they have the faces of men and hair like women. 
The hair like women represents that they would have long hair. All right, now, women in here that have short hair doesn't mean that just because you have, don't have long hair doesn't mean that you're not women, okay? So please don't uh, uh, get, get uh, all twisted. If you have short hair, long hair, if you're a woman, you're a woman. But when we're talking about long hair in the Bible, because the Bible in 1 Corinthians 11 talks about how the long hair is given to the woman for her covering. The long hair is for the, for the women. So they would have long hair like women, but they would have the faces of men. What is the face of, of, of a man? Beards. Now again, man, I know that there's some men in here that are clean shaven. Doesn't mean that just because you don't have a beard that you're not a man. I'm not saying that, but where they come from in the East, long hair, beards, faces of men long hair like women. Says that they have teeth like teeth of lions and crowns on the head. Turn to the book of Joel, chapter one. Let us identify what these, what, what the teeth of the lion are. Bible says in the book of Joel, chapter one. Long beards, long hair, come from the east, come from the desert. Riding on camels, horses, fierce warriors, given a command to destroy idolaters, false worshipers of false gods, but they don't touch the people that have the seal of God, those that are commandment keepers, Sabbath keepers. They are misguided about who Jesus Christ is and the Holy Spirit. The, the smoky furnace has darkened their understanding. But at the same time, they're still commanded and directed by God to accomplish a certain work. The Bible says in Joel chapter 1, Joel chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 6, Joel chapter 1, 6, For a nation is come up upon my land strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. The lion teeth represents that they would be a strong nation. Very fearless. Warriors, not afraid of anything. Long hair like a woman, but they're not effeminate, okay? They're, they're, they're very manly, all right? And the Bible tells us that they have the faces of men. They have beards, long beards, long enough for them to be able to stroke, okay? Now, the Bible says they had crowns on their head. What are these crowns on their heads? Let's turn to Ezekiel 23. Ezekiel chapter 23. Who are these people? We're, we're getting ready in these last moments together to identify who this is. In Ezekiel 23, verse 42. Ezekiel 23, verse 42. The Bible says, And a voice of a multitude being at ease was with her, and with the men of the common sort were brought Sabaeans from the wilderness, which put bracelets upon their hands and beautiful crowns upon their heads. And when we look at this word crown, we're talking about a turban. They have long hair like women, and they would wrap and tie their hair up, and they'd put turbans on, have long beards. They're from the wilderness. They put bracelets, jewels, gold upon their heads. They're called the Sabaeans. The Sabaeans are from the wilderness. Turn to the book of Job, chapter 1. Go to Job, chapter 1. Where do these Sabaeans come from, and, and what part of the world, what part of the earth are these Sabaeans from? They're from the east. I want you to notice in Job, chapter 1, the book of Job, where I want you to understand with me where Job was from. Because when we understand where Job is from, we'll understand where these Sabaeans are from. In Job chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the north. East. east. Job's story takes place in the east. It takes place in the land of us. 
which is in the east, the desert wilderness region of the world. And you remember what befell Job, those calamities that came upon him when he lost every earthly support that he had. The Bible tells us in Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 13, Job 1.13, Job 1.13, And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Job was in Uz. He was the greatest man of the east. We see these Sabaeans also in the east, in the land of Uz. The one that wear these crowns, these turbans ones that would have long hair like women, faces like men that would have long beards. They would be as lions, fierce warriors, riding on horses and camels, prepared unto the battle. Now, what is the origin of the, of the Sabaeans? Who is their father? Where do they come from? The Bible tells us in Genesis 25. Turn with me there to Genesis 25. Genesis 25. Genesis 25. Verse 1. Who's the father of the Sabaeans? Who's the father of the children of the east? From the wilderness. From the desert. That have scorpion power. To persecute. To hurt and torment and afflict those that don't have the seal of God. Genesis 25, 1. Then again, Ab Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua, and Jokshan begat Sheba, and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashuam, and Letishuam, and, and Le Leuman. Now notice, verse 3 says that Abraham had another wife, Keturah. This is after the death of Sarah. And the Bible says that he had some sons here. And verse 3 says, Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan. Sheba here is the father of the Sabaeans. This is their origin. All right? But Sheba and Dedan are brothers. Now, who, is, who are these people? Who, who are the Sabians? who have Abraham as their father. Notice with me in Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 21. Isaiah 21. Isaiah 21. Beginning with verse 13. Isaiah 21, 13. Sheba, father of the Sabaeans, father of Sheba, Abraham, Sheba and Dedan, our brothers. The Bible says here in Isaiah 21, verse 13, the burden upon Arabia, in the forest in Arabia, shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of Dedanim. Dedanim is Dedan. Okay, Dedan is the brother of Sheba. Their father is Abraham. Bible says, the verse 14, the inhabitants of the land of Tema brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread him that fled, for they fled from the swords, from the drawn swords, and from the bent bow, from the grievousness of war. Notice, we see, we see the bow, we see the sword, we see war being associated with, with, with Dedanim and these people from Arabia. It says in verse 16, For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, according to the years of an hireling, all the glory of Kedar shall fall, fail. And the residue of the number of archers, the mighty men of the children of Kedar, shall be diminished, for the Lord God of Israel hath spoken it. Now who is, who is Kedar? Who is Kedar? Where, where, does, where does Kedar come from? Well, we know he's associated with, with Arabia, but who is Kedar? Who is his, who is his father? I want you to turn to Genesis 25 again. Genesis 25, once again. Genesis 25. We're out of time here, but I just want to 
deal with this last point. Genesis chapter 25. The Bible says here in verse number Let's, just, let's, let's look at verse 5. It says, And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had. Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he, speaking about Abraham, yet lived eastward unto the east country. So Abraham spent his last days in the east country. He had many sons. You know, when the Bible says that Abraham is the father of many nations, that really is true. He really is the father of of many nations, all right? Now, going on in verse 11, verse 11 of the same chapter says, and it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lehi Roy. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, the Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's hand made him bear unto Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael is Nebajoth and Kedar and Adbil and Mibsam and then the other sons. He had 12, 12 princes just like Israel had 12 tribes. We see here that Ishmael also is associated with the number 12 in scripture. Now the Bible tells us that Kedar is Ishmael's son. So we're talking about a people, children of the east from the desert, from the wilderness. Long beards, long hair, turbans, riding on horses, camels, fierce warriors have the ability to tor torment, afflict, persecute those that don't have the seal of God, whose father is Abraham and also Ishmael, the people from Arabia. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 27, Ezekiel 27. Ezekiel chapter 27. I don't believe that we need any more um, identifying marks, do we? I think it's very plain what people that we're describing in the Bible. But the Bible tells us in the book of Ezekiel 27. Ezekiel 27 and verse 20. The Bible says in Ezekiel 27, 20, it says, Dedan and all thy merchants in the pledge of the clothes for chariots, Arabia and all the princes of Kedar, they occupied with thee in the lambs and rams and goats, and they were there thy merchants, the merchants of Sheba and Ramah, they were the merchants, they occupied in thy fairs with chief of all spices and with all precious stones and, and gold. Kedar is connected with Arabia, Sh uh, Sheba, Dedan, they're connected with Arabia, they're connected with Abraham. They're connected with Ishmael. Who are we talking about in Bible prophecy? We're talking about Islam. We're talking about the Muslim world in Bible prophecy. Now notice, we didn't, we didn't go into any history books. We didn't read any spirit of prophecy. We didn't go outside of any book but the Bible. Just like Israel is identified in Bible prophecy, Islam is also identified in Bible prophecy. They have a role to play in Bible prophecy just like Israel has a role to play in Bible prophecy, and we need to understand their role because their role is connected with us, just like they're connected with Abraham, and we too are connected with Abraham. Now, one last thing I want to read in Revelation 9. Revelation 9, go back there with me. I'm going to end here. God was faithful to his promise. He told, Ish he told Abraham that he was going to bless Ishmael. He said he's going to make him fruitful and he's going to multiply him. Did he not multiply and make Ishmael's descendants fruitful? Oh, yes, he did. And when we look at Revelation 9, verse 11, it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name is in the Hebrews Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. The word Apollyon and Abaddon means the destroyer, the angel, the, the, the messenger, the king of the bottomless pit. I want you to notice that 
In Revelation 9, verse 11, 9 11 is speaking about this, this, this leader that would come and would organize this nation of fierce warriors into a kingdom. And I don't think it's an accident that it's there, 9-11. Now, verse 12 says, One woe is past, and behold, there come two, mo two more woes hereafter. We're going to study tomorrow the trumpets. We're going to study the woes. We're going to talk about 9-11. Not an accident that 9-11 is there in Revelation. Not an accident that Sister White talks about what happened on 9-11 in New York. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, beginning on page 11. That's, that's no coincidence, no, no, no accident there. Um, but in closing, but in closing, verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of their works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, neither which can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their thefts. The armies of Islam was directed to hurt and torment and then eventually kill all idol worshipers all idolaters. How does Islam feel about idols today? Do they like idols? Do they like people with graven images? No. You know why? Because in the Bible, that's why. Because Jesus Christ said so. There are many the short those that don't have the seal of God. So we need to find out then tomorrow, who are they attacking? Who are they attacking? Who are they bringing judgment and chastisement to? Who were those in this time period that were worshiping idols and devils of gold and silver and, and brass and iron and wood and stone? Those that were involved in fornication and, and sorcery and murder. Who, who were these people that Islam was raised up to attack and to bring down? We'll find that out tomorrow. Let us have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the line of the tribe of Judah opening up his prophetic word to us. Thank you that he has clearly outlined this mighty nation of Islam and Bible prophecy, just as clearly as ancient Israel and modern Israel are outlined. So you have also appointed the ancient people of Islam to be able to declare to us modern Islam and help us to see their role and in time events, as you have showed us our role in in time events, and to see how they help to empower the book of Daniel, the message of the hour, how they help to empower the, the great Advent movement, the final Advent movement that we are now living in. We pray that you would breathe upon us the breath of God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would revive, would reform. We pray that the Word of God, as it is opened, and as it is studied line upon line that we would have rest and refreshing and that the Word of God will become a new book to us. We would have a new and living experience. And that our hearts would burn within us as we walk and talk with Thee through the Scriptures. Thank You so much for blessing us and for guiding and leading us in our study today. In Jesus' name, Amen.